we do want to welcome everyone, and especially the mothers. If can the mothers in the house stand? If you can stand, if some if you can't, somebody can lift you up, maybe. Paul will go around and lift everybody. Yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being mothers. Um, does anyone in here have a mother or had? Anybody? Anybody not have a mother? Ever. All right. Now, mothers are are extremely special, and man, where would we be without mothers? Nowhere. That's correct. Nowhere. Literally. So, thank you all of you mothers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about moms later, but uh, like we've started uh, to do, we want to share testimonies, and so uh, this morning I'm going to have Billy come up and share a testimony with us about something that God did in his life that's pretty stinking awesome. Good morning. Uh, I'm trying to keep this a little short, but... So, I think it was three years ago, um, stopped by the eye doctor routine, yearly check, going through the motions and... uh, Man, his face dropped and color drained out of him and tell something was different, you know, and he looks at his computer and comes back and looks at my eye again and you could feel the tension in the room and kind of jokingly I thought, said, huh, I don't think eyeball cancer was even a thing. He looks at me and he's like, Well, this is the third time I've seen it in twenty one years. So now my color's dawn. <laughs> we switched places there. So I got to go home and tell my wife. And this is like on a Wednesday or something. And I decided I wasn't telling anybody for a while. And uh, we had some friends come over for dinner, prearranged. And the Lord really speaks through this man. It was just a conversation, nothing going on. And out of the blue, he asked me, he's like, would you let something as simple as a cancer diagnosis derail your faith? And that didn't even fit the conversation that we were having. And it hit me hard. I excused myself from the table for a minute and I got to thinking, I was like, nobody knows. Like, I have my wife, my business partner, and the doctor. That's it. So it finally dawned upon me. It's like, he's not asking me this question. So we come to church the following Sunday there, and Nathan's teaching about uh, deliberate obedience to the Lord at the end of it he goes in and he's it says if you have healings you need to come forth and get the blessings and elders pray over you and everything honestly I know it happens if I read the Bible you know but in my life that's something that I haven't seen much success with Like Jerry's miracle, I've seen those. Bill's miracle, you know, those are undisputable. You can't argue them. The healing miracles, it seems like there's always, in my opinion, little success or there's an easy way to explain your way out of it. You know, oh, it was a healing. Oh, it was antibiotics. (laughs) But we came up here and Nathan asked me what's going on and told him I was like went to the doctor and they said come back in three months and expect a cancer diagnosis for real on, on writing. So we started praying, a lot of you guys came up and got going into it and uh I started feeling the spirit 
like I'd never felt the Spirit before in my life. The warmth, the peace, it was just amazing. And at the end of it, Nathan looks me in the eye and he says, you did what you were supposed to do, this ends today. I was like, cancer is easy. I've had this for a week and it's over. When I walked out that door, I was convinced. It, done deal. So after service, of course, a lot of people gathered around, had questions, and uh, Angie Lewis L. at the time was working for one of the leading retina surgeons in the Kansas City area. I told her the story, and she was like, you're not waiting three months to go back. And she went to work, and the next day I had an appointment for two weeks down the road. Well, <clears throat> I didn't really care to go. It was more kind of peace of mind for my wife because I was convinced it was over, you know. And to the point that I almost felt like it was disrespectful to go to the doctor, <laughs> honestly. So we go and he does this test and everything, comes in the room, looks in my eye and and leans me back up a little bit, and as he's leaning me up, he goes, hey, do you have health insurance? Which is not an uncommon question at the eye doctor, because sometimes there's procedures that they want to do, but insurance doesn't cover. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, thank goodness, because you're going to need it. I like, go, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, that's melanoma, eye cancer. I'm going to send you to a specialist." Now, the sooner we get this taken care of, the better your odds are. Very aggressive, showed us the picture. I mean, I remembered the picture exactly. And uh, my world got flipped over again. So it was probably four weeks before we could get into the next specialist. And there's only, this is so rare that there's only one in a 260 mile radius of Kansas City, other than the one that's here. So we go in, and by this point, I'm depressed. Um, honestly, starting to struggle with my faith. Like, life's unraveling quickly. You know, we live a lifestyle that my wife can't do on her own, so we're starting to sell assets and making changes, and life's just a mess. So we go to the next specialist, and uh, she looks in, she does all her own tests and looks at everything. She's like, yeah, there's definitely something there, but it's not as urgent as what the previous doctor had said. She's like, let's hold up for a second here and told us about our treatments, what they would be. Um, worst case, obviously, is it spreads. If it spreads, there's zero percent of survivability. They don't even treat it. If we get it treated before it spreads, I'll be blind. And they'll have to burn the eye so bad with radiation that I'll at best, I'll be able to a little bit of peripheral vision. Well, <clears throat> we uh, go on with life, trying to make adjustments, and it was several weeks into it, and I heard that question again. It's like, are you going to let a little cancer diagnosis derail your faith? And embarrassingly enough, at this point, it had started. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm not. So I pulled my head and my hind in and started doing what I was supposed to be doing. We went to the doctor the next time. And uh, she's looking at it. And she's like, let's wait six months. And I'm like, we just six weeks ago you were talking about if this spreads, I'm done. You know, I'm not in a hurry to go blind, but 
let's do some explaining here, you know. I was like, well, you were so far off from the other two doctors. I don't want to discredit you, but and I was like, have you even looked at what the other doctor sent over? She's like, I don't have to. I did my own. I was like, look, look at what he sent. She opens it up. She's like, that, that's a different eye. I was like, no, it's not. And that's the exact same picture. That's, that picture is burned in my mind. I can't draw, but I can pick it out of a police lineup. That's my eye. That's that picture. She's got another doctor with her because she's always trying to teach since she's the only one around. And uh, he starts looking at her pictures versus that picture. He kind of taps her. And he's like, it's the same eye. She's like, no, it's not. Then they're both staring at it. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, we're mapping out the blood vessels from pitcher to pitcher to make sure that they sent the right file. I was like, okay. Well, after it's all said and done, she looks and she's like, I can't explain that, but this is a lot better than what it was, so let's do six months. Like, okay. So we do the six months a couple times there, and each time it's nothing's changing. Let's hold off, let's hold off, you know? So now I'm like, it wasn't the healing I th thought I was got, but, you know, this is working. And I've been very, very blessed and thankful, and uh, I've considered it a healing, and then. I got even more confirmation just Tuesday, I think it was, last week. We went and uh, went through all the tests again, same thing. I've done it so much now that I'm sitting with her next to the, you know, all right, what if, you know, she pulls them up and, go, which one's last year's and which one's this year's? She's like, last year, this year. I go, it changed. She's like, yeah, it did. I was like, oof, you know, that's not exactly what I was, I like nothing. She stood there and stared at it and back and forth, back and forth. And she was like, it changed and this is the best it's ever looked. She goes, I don't know how it changed for the better. Yet again. So, I know those healing Miracles are hard to just see, but man, they happen. And it may not just be the light switch that you think, but you just have to keep believing. And uh, it's real easy to get down, give up, but uh, I guess that's the gist of it, just keep believing, and, and it does happen. I just wanted to. Share. So, thanks. Wow. God's timing is amazing, isn't it? Isn't that just like God, though? Like, we want things immediate. We expect them immediately. Um, and this is just as good as immediately. I mean... For me, it is because I haven't had to struggle with the the stress and the worry, you know, and everything that comes along with it. And that's so encouraging because, you know, Billy, he didn't say that he didn't stress. He didn't say that he wasn't worried. In fact, he said he was stressed. He was worried. He was questioning, you know, but isn't it just like the enemy to try to lie to you about what God is doing? Try to cause that doubt in you. And isn't it great that we have such an awesome God that even when we doubt, He's still faithful. Even when it's hard for us to stand on the promises of God, He still says, I know it's not easy, but I'm still going to do what I'm going to do because I have a plan for you. And that I wish that Billy never had to go through that. But now he has a testimony that's going to be for the, the benefit of all of us. Thank God for testimonies. 
Each and every one of you have a testimony that God has done in your life one way or another. Even if you don't recognize it right now, it might not be something like that, but he's done something in your life that can benefit other people if they hear it, if you're willing to tell it. And I would just encourage you guys, be willing to tell it. Um, Sometimes God does heal instantaneously. Sometimes he heals when we ask. I've, I've literally had God heal me when I didn't ask for it, and it was a miraculous, instantaneous healing. He does it because He's a good, good Father. He created you. He loves you intimately. More than you can even fathom, He loves you. Even when you think that He doesn't. I think I've told you guys about a... a time where I was just maybe 12 or 13 or something, going to a Rich Mullins concert. And I was sick as sick could be, man. I mean, like my mom didn't want me to go, but she let me go because I faked not being as sick as I was. But I was like, I had the shakes and and I was struggling with like flu-like symptoms and stuff and was trying not to throw up before we got to the concert even. And while I'm at the concert, I'm sitting there just like feeling like I'm going to die. And I wasn't even necessarily praying uh, for God to heal me or anything. I was just trying to not die at the Rich Mullins concert, honestly. And, uh, but I really, really wanted to be there because I loved this dude. I loved his music, great worship music and stuff. And um, I was in really bad shape. And Rich walks out onto the stage and... He didn't say anything. He didn't pray over people or anything. But whenever he comes out, you know, everybody stands up because we know we're getting ready to worship. And as soon as he strummed his guitar and started to sing, I felt something just go boom and hit me. And I like, I mean, I felt it was this, it wasn't like a wind, but it was kind of like a wind. It was like a presence hit me and instantly I was completely 100% healed completely. No more signs, no more symptoms, nothing. I was completely healed and got to worship that whole time. It was so fun. So fun. But God does really cool, awesome stuff like that, you know? Because you would for your kids. Anybody in here have kids? Who in here? And you don't have to raise your hand, but if you have a kid in here and your kid was sick and you could take it from them and and you would even take the sickness, you would be the one to be sick. You would. At the drop of a hat, of course we would. Because we love our kids that much. Well, we are his children and he loves us that much. All right. Let's jump into Acts chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 13 of Acts chapter 13. There's a lot of uh, scripture to read, but I am going to kind of smoke through it. A little bit fast because I know some people have barbecues and take mom out to lunch and and do fun stuff for her today. So I'll try to make this somewhat quick. But there's some really fun stuff in here that you're not going to want to miss too. So without any further ado, we have Paul and Barnabas. They are on their first missionary journey. And we went through the first uh, 12 chapters the other day. So Paul and his, command, uh, his companions left for um, Paphmos by ship for Pamphylius, landing at the port town of Perga. So up until this point, it was Barnabas and Paul. Now it's Paul and his companions. So this is kind of where that shift takes place. Pretty neat. They were traveling around with John Mark, which was Barnabas' cousin, and... He's the one that wrote uh, the book of Mark in the Bible as well. But it says there, whenever they got there, and where they were traveling from, so they go from the, um, the island of Cyprus over to uh, the next land mass that they come to is southeastern Turkey. And it says, There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland into Antioch of Pisidia. So... If you know anything about Acts, you're like, well, they just left Antioch. 
Now you're saying that they go to another Antioch? Well, the, the Antioch that they left was the most popular Antioch that everybody really knows about. It's about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Now they go to Antioch of Pisidia, which is in modern-day Turkey. Two totally different places, but, um, but that's where they decided to head to first. Also, Paul, also named Saul, is from Turkey, um, from Tarsus, which is actually in Turkey, so pretty close to where they were. And it says, on the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue for the service. I think that it's, it's worth mentioning that Paul and Barnabas still went to the synagogue on the Sabbath for service. Even though um, the Jews at that time were who brutally tortured and killed Jesus. And these are some of the same guys that, that Paul knows that he's going to cause a ruckus. He's going to upset some people because he's going to start teaching about Jesus and he knows that they don't necessarily want to hear it, but he knows that they need to hear it and that's what Jesus has called him to do. So it says, after the usual reading from the books of Moses and the prophets, some translations say from the law and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So here's these newcomers showing up to church, and the leaders of the church say, hey, here's some guys that seem to be able to talk fairly well. If you want to share with our congregation, go for it. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's gutsy there, boys. That might backfire on you, and it did, which is good, in a, in a good way. We would be happy with it. Um, any word of encouragement, I think that that's important to point out, is that we are to encourage one another. We are to build each other up, come alongside each other. And so here they are. Paul stood up and lifting his hand to quiet them. I think that's interesting. They were all, they were all talking so much. He's like, hey, keep it down. I'm about to say something, people. It says he started speaking and he said, Men of Israel, he said, You and God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. So here's something that's really cool. He's in a synagogue, and he says, you men of Israel and God-fearing Gentiles. So this synagogue also had Gentiles in it. Does anybody remember whenever Paul got in huge trouble and got almost killed because there was a rumor going around that he brought Gentiles into the synagogue? But at this synagogue, there were already Gentiles there. I, I don't know. I, just, I pick up on little stuff. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Uh, verse 13 or 16 is where I'm at right now. Chapter 13, verse 16. It says, He lifted up His hands to quiet them and started speaking. And he, He's talking to the Jewish people and the Gentiles that were also there. He said, listen to me. Listen to me. He said, God of this nation, of Israel, chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. He chose our ancestors. God chose these ancestors that He's talking about, and He chose you to be right where you are. In the, in the phase of life that you're in, in the stage of life that you're in, with your area of influence, with the people around you, your family, wherever you are, He chose to put you there. He's God. He rules and He reigns. And I saw something the other day. It said um, something about if you can look out into creation... And you can thank God for how awesome and amazing He is at all the things that He's made. And then you look in the mirror and you're disgusted. You really need to rethink that. Because He made you too. And if He's a perfect God, and He made creation perfect, you are His creation. You are worthy. You are made fearfully and wonderfully made by a God that wanted you. The God that wanted you. So that's something that we should really, we should really consider. It says, He made them strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a, with a powerful arm, He led them out of their slavery. 
He put up with them, which my translation says he put up with them, through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So some translations or manuscripts say um, that he cared for them. And that, that uh, coincides with Deuteronomy and Samuel. Uh, you probably have that in your footnotes down in your own Bible. But I, I do agree with my translation where it says he put up with them. If you've, if you've ever studied the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, it's like, man, we do serve a patient God. We really do. And then, if you're honest with yourself, you can go, well, he's put up with me a lot too. But it says, Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. They're still battling over that land today. This took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. If you know anything about King David or King Saul, King Saul was replaced by King David because he, he was disobedient and he turned his heart away from God. King David was not perfect in any means, by any means. He didn't even get to build the temple because he was a man of warfare and had killed so many people. But he says, he will do everything I want him to do. You know, the only thing that God held against David as king was the uh, sin that he had with Bathsheba whenever he killed Uriah the Hittite and then slept with his wife. Other than that, God pretty much gave him free reign. David repented. He had to pay some consequences for that with the loss of his first son. But I love how this talks about how God says he will do everything that I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. This is whenever things start to get a little rocky in the synagogue. You know, people are going, what did he just say? Most of them probably had heard of Jesus at this time, or at least some of them I'm sure had. But I'm sure most of these people are like, no, that couldn't be the Messiah. You know what I mean? And then here's this guy. Why did we give him the mic? Who, who did that? You know? It says, he goes on, he says, Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. Now, a lot of people believe that there are so many prerequisites that have to happen before you can... Um, enter the kingdom of heaven. And we are supposed to be baptized if we can. I'm not going to say that you're not. We are supposed to repent of our sins. We are supposed to declare that Jesus is king. Um, we all are supposed to be baptized for sure. But I just want us to be real, real clear about the fact that Jesus is your Savior. He is the Messiah. He's the one that determines whether or not you get to enter into the kingdom of heaven or not. Um, I'm in verse 20. I'm going to be in verse 25, so I've got to try to remember that. But Jesus, I heard somebody tell this story the other day that they were talking about this thief on the cross, right? You got the two thieves. Um, some people say that they were murderers or whatever, but you've got these two, these two people hanging on the cross next to Jesus, and both of them were running their mouth about Jesus. Both of them were making fun of him. And then one of them realizes, he has this understanding of the fact that, wow, this dude in between us, he is God. He is the Son of the Most High God. And then he's telling the other dude, look, we deserve to be here. This guy doesn't deserve to be here. And he's coming to this realization. There's nothing that shows anywhere in this guy's life that he had ever been baptized, that he had ever been raised in the church, that he had ever, you know, done anything to deserve to go to the kingdom of heaven, right? 
And all he does is he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew this guy really is the real deal. And Jesus says what? Today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, look, I'm going to get you down off this cross. You've got to go get baptized. You've got to go join a church. You've got to you know, make amends with everything. You've got to do all this, these different things. And then we'll talk about you coming into my kingdom. He didn't do that. So imagine this dude gets to heaven because he dies shortly after that, after they break his legs and stuff. He gets to heaven, and imagine that he's showing up at this gate. And he's got to be thinking, man, I do not deserve to be here. And then he meets the people at the gate, and they're like, um, can I help you? And he's like, uh, yeah, I was, I was just down there, and now I'm supposed to be here. And they're like, well, have you been baptized? No. Hmm. And what church were you with? I, I wasn't with a church. Okay, what have you done in your life that, that would allow you to be here? And he would have to humbly say, I've done nothing to be here. But there was a guy on a cross down there with me that told me that I could come. And they would open it up and say, welcome home. You know, it's that, it's that simple. It's just that simple. And that's what Paul's trying to lay out here for these guys. He's telling them about Jesus. He says, as John was um, finishing his ministry, he asked, do you think I am the Messiah? So he's talking to these people. He says, do you think I'm the Messiah? No, I'm not. But he is coming soon, and I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the sandals on his feet. People were trying to lift John the Baptist up on a pedestal, and he's like, I'm not the dude. That's not me. I'm not the guy. But the guy that's coming is him, and I'm not even worthy to be, um, to be in the same place as him. Yet the Holy Spirit filled John the Baptist while he was still in his mother's womb, specifically to prepare the way for Jesus. And the Word says that if... If, if you raise me up, that I will draw all men unto myself. I, I just think that that's so cool. John the Baptist was doing that. And then Paul goes on, he says, Brothers, you're you sons of Abraham, and also you God-fearing Gentiles, the message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as one of the prophets, um, had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Sabbath. Here's, here's what he says. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. When they had done all of that, the prophecies said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and over a period of many days he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. He's giving them a warning. That's kind of what he's doing right here. He's saying, the one that, these, that the law and the prophets talk about, that's Jesus. That's this guy that I'm telling you about. He fulfilled all these prophecies. And he starts to lay out the prophecies a little bit of what Jesus had fulfilled. He says, and now we are here to bring this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another psalm explains it more fully. He says, you will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David. Because people thought that that was a reference to David. He says, this is not a reference to David. For after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. No. It was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. 
God's allowing Peter or allowing Paul to have the the wisdom, the understanding to be able to put this out to these guys in a way that they're going to they've they've got to understand. He's laying it out very clearly. Now, do they understand? We're about to find out. He says, "Brothers, listen. We are here to proclaim that through this man Jesus there is forgiveness for your sins." Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. He says, be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. What were the words that he's talking about? He says, for they said, look, you mockers, be amazed and die. Whoa. He says, for I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Paul is saying, for goodness sakes, don't let yourselves be blind. Understand what God was saying through these prophets. Don't let him be talking about you. Jesus is the true Messiah. I want to look back real quick. He says, Everyone who believes in Him is made right in God's sight. Made right in God's sight? Made right in God's sight. Man, when God looks at you, if you believe that Jesus is who He says that He is, if you believe what God says about Him, then you have been made right in God's sight. A lot of churches and a lot of people in the world today don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus. They're like, that's offensive. Well, as many of you know, I'm okay with being offensive. Um, I would rather the things that I say don't offend you. But if you're offended at the truth, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not going to not tell the truth. But Jesus shed his blood. His body was torn so that we truly could have a relationship with him, so that we truly could enter in to his presence. He told the Father, he said, I want them to be with me in my glory that I had before the foundations of the world was created. I want them to see me. I want them to be with me where I am, with you. That's what he's saying. That's so awesome. And we're made right in God the Father's sight because of what Jesus did by His blood. So please don't be offended by the blood. It's the one thing that's going to save your life for all eternity. Brittany and I watched a a film last night. It was kind of a movie, kind of a documentary, and it's called After Death. Anybody ever heard of it? If you haven't, you should write it down, you should look it up, and you should most definitely watch it. Um, it's not necessarily a Christian movie. Like I said, it's more of a documentary, but these, uh, these scientists and these doctors, they literally went around, they started hearing about people that had experiences of life after death. I like a phrase that they use, life after life, though, because death, death is only a thing that we know here. A very good friend of mine just died Um, a week ago. But the word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We only know death because we're the ones that experience the loss. They step out of this body and boom, they're literally in their their spirit body. There is no, they're no more. They literally step out of this into their spiritual realm. And this this documentary starts talking about what these people see. So I'm I'm telling you, age ranges, they went and interviewed people from little people all the way up to old people. From all over the world, thousands and thousands of people they've interviewed, people that have never met each other, some people that have never heard anything about the fact that there's life after death or anything like that. They've never heard somebody else's story to be able to corroborate it with their own. And they all tell very extremely similar stories. 
Like, there's no two that are identical, but there are so many that they all have this basically set of how it works and what they see and what they hear and what they experience and what they feel. And they immediately, like the ones that, there are some that go to, uh, start to go to heaven, some that start to go to hell. They show the very clear differences. Guys, I, at the end of it, I was like, I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> I know, God, God, I know you have a purpose and a plan for me. But all of them that were going to heaven, and I'm not talking like the, the most holy people ever, just people like me and you. But every single one of them said, I did not want to come back. I didn't want to come. If I could go right now, I would go right now. And like they see this, first of all, absolutely no pain. All of their senses are just incredible, incredible. They can see themselves, what's going on, but there, there's no pain. There's no sadness, no sorrow, no nothing like that. They just see what's going on. And uh, they're just, they all describe just being way better than what we are here on this earth, you know? And they talk about this, this light that, that there's no words to actually describe it. But this light is not just light, it's love. And it's literally God's presence just radiating. And they're so drawn to it. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So... Uh, and they talk about seeing Jesus, having conversations with Jesus, seeing their loved ones. Guys, I'm talking people all over the world. It's, it's the real deal, you know. But please, uh, I encourage you to go, go watch it. It's called After Death. Anyhow, so Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day after he just gave them this warning. And it says, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. So they're trying to follow them around. And the main thing that they're telling them is, hey, listen, rely on the grace of God. So as they're giving them that encouragement, they're also trying to get them to open up their understanding. You know, They know that they're coming back next week and they're going to really start uh, sharing, sharing words of life with them. So then, it says the following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. Word got around in this small town. These guys have something very interesting that I think the rest of us really need to listen to. I'm sure that there were people that truly wanted to hear it, and that there were probably other people that are going, we're going to get to watch a stoning next week. So come out if you want to be entertained, right? Maybe not. I mean, the word doesn't say that. That was just me inputting that in there. But it says, when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. It didn't matter what he said. They were going to argue against it because their teachings never brought out this kind of crowd. And they were jealous. Guys, jealousy is absolutely horrible. They, you know, these guys invited them back, but that they fell, they fell into the trap of jealousy is what happened. Satan started to work in their lives. And um, they, they fell right into his trap. And I encourage you guys, don't fall into that trap. Just don't do it. And if you don't agree with something that somebody else is saying right off the bat, I encourage you to take some time, think about it, before you speak, before you start making judgments and stuff like that. Think about it. Pray about it. I can't tell you how many times I have been wrong and then open my big mouth too quickly just to find out that I was wrong. It happens. But it says, Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. 
But since you have rejected and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, wow, we will offer it to the Gentiles, for the Lord gave us this command when He said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the fathers, uh, to the farthest corners of the earth. He literally tells them, He says, But since you have rejected the word that God told me to give you, and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. There is one way to the Father. One way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And by rejecting Him, you reject the Father. That's a fact. Think if somebody rejects your child, doesn't want anything to do with your child, do they get to still hang out with you? If they do, you're wrong. And you better check yourself. <laughs> you know? But, he says, you've judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life by what you've done here, by rejecting Him. Paul, Paul lets us know, he says, I've made you, uh, God told him, I've made you light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. He says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for His message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. All of us are called. All of us are called, but not everyone will choose. But if you do choose to follow Him, you've got to understand that He chose you first not something that you just got to go, well, I know God didn't want me here, but uh, I'm going to make my own way. That's not the case. But everybody gets the opportunity. Some people won't choose, though. So the Lord's message spread throughout that region. It says, Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. It's interesting that this is the same thing that, that Paul was doing back when he was Saul, and he got letters from the, uh, from the high priest to be able to go round up these Christians. He did the same thing, so he knew it was coming. It wasn't a surprise to him by any means. Um, but here's what they did. Paul, Barnabas, the whole group of people that are with him, because there were several people with him that traveled with him. It says, they shook the dust from their feet, as a sign of rejection, and went to the town of Iconium. So, we don't do stuff like that necessarily these days. Um, maybe we do st things similar to that, but we don't necessarily shake the dust off of our feet, you know. But we do wa wash our hands of, of people, you know. I'm sure that they were sad that people weren't accepting the Word of God, but the Word tells us, that if they rejected Jesus, how much more are they going to reject us too? You know, we've got to understand that there's a possibility that we will be rejected. But they shake the dust from their, from their feet as a sign of rejection uh, of them. And then it says, And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So they, they just get rejected out of this town. So much so, they get driven out of town by an angry mob of people that don't like what they're saying, yet they are filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do you think they would be filled with joy because they just got ran out of town? It's really because they get to now identify with the sufferings of their Savior, Jesus Christ. It's when we can identify with our Savior and the sufferings, the struggles that He went through. You know, we all want to try to be able to try to earn salvation, right? Well, whenever you get to partake in the sufferings for Him, you get to identify with Him. That's great, man. It is great. And they should be excited about it. We should be excited about it. We don't get as excited about it because... We hardly ever do anything on His behalf to suffer, you know? It's like, well, we don't, we don't have to deal with all of the, 
the ridicule and stuff that they had to deal with back then, I bet we would if we were as bold as they were. <laughs> you know, I'm speaking to myself. I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm speaking to myself as well. But anyhow, that wraps up Acts chapter 13. Um, about mothers. I know my wife was probably like, that's all you're going to say about mothers whenever I go right into Acts chapter 13. But no, there's more. I was fortunate enough to be raised by a mother that um, let me be a boy um, that thought that I was the greatest kid ever, I think, you know, sometimes. Maybe that wasn't the best thing, but uh, it worked out great. My mom is such a, an amazing mother, and I promise you I couldn't be standing up here today without her. Without my mom, uh, I can't even tell you that I would have any relationship with the Lord whatsoever. This morning, whenever I, I contacted my mom to wish her Happy Mother's Day, I, I specifically thanked her for introducing me to God the Father, introducing me to a relationship with Jesus and my best friend, the Holy Spirit, um, and not shying away from any of it, you know, allowing me to understand that God's a big God. He's a whole lot bigger than anything I can wrap my mind around. And sometimes people worship differently. Sometimes people uh, uh, have a different type of relationship with Him, and that's okay as long as we continue to give Him glory and honor and praise. And, and my mom laid those foundations for me. My wife is, I get to experience watching one of the most amazing, well, in my mind, the most amazing mother ever, um, raise our three beautiful daughters, and our, we get to help raise our granddaughter too, kind of, whenever our oldest daughter lets us. Uh, she always lets us. A lot of times we don't even ask, you know what I mean? But... Um, the way that she operates with our, with our kids, she's always seeking God's face. She's always asking for wisdom and guidance and direction. She's always in the Word, and she leads them and parents them in such a, a biblical way. It's, it's such just an incredible honor to be able to watch you. I've learned so much from you. You're such a great mother. My mother-in-law, her mama, is a great example of love and kindness and caring. And uh, a lot of people don't like their in-laws. I don't know. Don't raise your hand if you don't. But uh, um, but there are some great... <laughs> there are some... Uh, there are some great, great, great mother-in-laws that, that if it weren't for them, the world might not go around, you know? And my, my oldest daughter, Trinity, watching her, she's 20 years old right now and has a little baby, and I'm like, man, she's just a baby herself. That, no offense to any young people in the room, but, but uh, she's a great mother, you know? She's a great mother, and I am just honored to to be able to have a great mother, to be around great mothers. So many of you in here I know are just phenomenal mothers, and God has, has put something very, very special in you guys, very, very, very special in you. To be able to raise up a human, He has entrusted you to birth a human being and then keep them alive. Like if guys had to do that, I don't think we would have lasted very long. You know, I mean, we can't even get a cold, really, if you think about it, without whining and crying about it. But, I mean, not me, but, but the rest of you guys, I mean, I've heard about it. But imagine being Jesus' mother, though. You know what I mean? Jesus was her firstborn. What a lucky lady. Our, first, our firstborn was such a great baby and everything, you know. She really was. She's super easy to take care of, but I can't even imagine how easy Jesus was to take care of. But then she had other kids, you know what I mean? And she's like, oh, wow. 
that that wasn't what I anticipated because Jesus was nothing like that, you know? I, I wasn't ready for this. Um, Michael Jr. always talks about uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and he says, James probably heard a lot. James, why can't you be more like Jesus? You know? But um, when I was growing up, I've got a brother that's about two and a half years older than me. I, I always tell him that now I tell him he's like at least three years older than me. But back then he was only barely two years older than me, you know, how that goes. Well, my brother brought this baby duck home one day. Uh, I don't think he asked. If he did ask, he was told that he couldn't bring it home. It's been a while, so I don't really remember the story perfectly. But he brings this baby duck home and has it in his bed with him, you know, trying to hide it from mom and dad, because I'm pretty sure he was told no. And uh, I think that's probably, it runs in the family, because my kids always come home with these animals, and I'm like, what? No, you're not getting any more animals. And then here's all these different animals. Like, I'm like, what in the world? And I, I'm telling you, as this, my youngest daughter right here, we're talking ferrets, Got rid of the ferrets. Fish. Fish died not too long ago. Oh, she got another fish. I had no idea. See? See how that works? Um, a tarantula, lizards, rats, another dog, cats that she says, I'm, they're my cats now. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're taking that with you when you go. But uh, but my brother, he has this uh, this. Little baby duck. It's cute, but ducks make messes, guys, and they stink. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to have a duck in the house, but they stink bad, and they crap all over everything. Sorry for saying the word crap, but that's what it did. And uh, we named it Quackers because it quacked. But um, we also have a dog named Pig, right? So, but whatever. But um, this duck, as it got older... We only had one duck. I guess you're supposed to have multiple ducks, but we only had one. And so we had this dog that had puppies, and the duck came in and ran the mama dog out of where the puppies were, and she only let the mama dog come in to nurse the puppies. They were her puppies. So she became the mother of these puppies. I'm 100% serious. I'm not making this up at all. Um, but she mothered these puppies pretty well. Like, she did a really good job, and she wasn't even the same species, you know, but she had that mothering instinct that God put in her, and she's a duck, you know? She's just a duck. But you moms out there, you're created in the image and in the likeness of God. A duck's not created in the image and the likeness of God, but you are, and maybe you... Uh, maybe you've had your own kids, or maybe you've adopted kids, or maybe you haven't had any kids, but, but you still have mothered kids. You've still mothered people. You've still showed that nurturing and caring and all that stuff. That's because you're made in the image and in the likeness of God. And even if you've never had kids, or even if you don't have kids, or whatever, God can still use you to impact other people, to, raise, to help raise them, to help mother them, to help sustain them with what they need. This duck couldn't, couldn't nurse these puppies, but she could do everything else, you know? And she did really well. So I just encourage you guys. Um, mothers continue to affect your area of influence, whether it's your own kids or somebody else's kids. My wife mothers all kinds of kids that come in our house. Um, and she does a really good job of it. I have a feeling you have something else to say, don't you? All right. I may be back, I might not. I don't know how she's going to do this. But. Can I, stay up here? I just wanted to pray a, play, a prayer of blessing. And I love the story that he told about the duck because this morning when I woke up, um, gosh, I keep getting emotional, sorry. Um, I was just thinking about some friends that I have that have been trying for a really long time to be a mama. And it made me think of them because I know days like today can be hard for those people who have that desire and, or maybe who've struggled with infertil infertility or there may be some of you that had miscarriages and stuff. And, and, and I just love that example because women are made 
with a uniqueness that is a part of the image of God that he didn't put in men and vice versa. And so if you're a woman, you have that nurturing spirit. And just like Nathan was saying, you can mother and you will mother if you allow God to move through you. And the Lord, I was sitting there thinking about that and I was praying for my friends that are standing in faith and believing, you know, for their babies uh, that are to come. And the Lord reminded me, I actually had to text my husband because I remembered the story, but I couldn't remember where it was at. But in Acts 9, it talks about a disciple of Jesus named, well, she was a follower of Christ, named Tabitha. And it talks about how she was always taking care of people. She was helping the poor, and you can tell she just was loving on people, and she got sick and died. And um, people came to Peter and were begging him to come. And so Peter went with them, and, uh, he, and it says, all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that she had made uh, while she was still with them. And so it just shows that love. Like they were devastated because of the impact that she had had in their lives. And so basically Peter sent them all out of the room and he basically said, get up. (laughs) And she got up and she was healed and resurrected, which is awesome. But I felt like the Lord reminded me of this story because he wanted to say to the women out there, that maybe are not biological mothers, that you are valuable and you are worthy and he loves you and you have impact on the children, your spiritual children. And like Nathan said, that goes for us that have biological children. Maybe your kids are grown and moved away. You know, you can still nurture and love and have impact. And I'm telling you, these generations need it. Because yes, there are many without fathers, but there are many that had broken mothers. And they need another woman to come along and show them what a loving, godly mother looks like. And they need to be nurtured and loved. So I just wanted to share that for anyone out there that um, may be in that situation. And then if you don't mind, I wanted to just pray a prayer of uh, blessing over us this morning. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your love. We thank you that we've got to receive that unconditional love, and as women, we get to just allow that love to be the love that we show in mothering and nurturing others. So I thank you, Lord, for every woman here that is a mother. And I thank you for the impact that she's had in her children's life and, and the impact in those in her family. I thank you for every woman here that's trying to become a mother. I just pray today a blessing over their womb, that you bless the fruit of their womb, Lord God. I pray that you would give them the faith to stand and begin to expand their tent pegs and knowing that you're faithful. And I just pray for all of us as women that we would just do everything we can to love and nurture and be an example to those around us, to mother them in whatever way that means. Lord, and it may be an adult that needs mothered by us. It's not necessarily just children, Lord God, but I just pray a a prayer of blessing. I pray that these women would be blessed going in, that they would be blessed coming out, that everything they lay, lay their hand to would be blessed. And I pray that you would just fill them with your love, even maybe in their own hearts for the areas of wounds where their mother may have fallen short, Lord God. We just thank you for that, and we thank you for mothers, and we thank you for these women today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.